And while Jessica's setting up, welcome to everyone who's just joined us. Really glad to have you here today. Um, does that look okay? Not blurry. We can see your screen. Can you see Jessica's screen, everybody? It says iconic photos throughout history. Carl, thanks for letting me know. We're glad you're here. Great. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm really happy to be here uh, with you all to go over some iconic photographs throughout history. Um, what was I going to ask? What was I going to say? I had a question and I forgot. It's okay. Um, anyway, so these photographs that we're going to look at, some of them are probably going to be very familiar. I know our first one is going to be pretty familiar, I hope. <laughs> Um, I think everyone's seen it. I have seen it and it's, it's just a time, one of those timeless pictures. So I would love to just invite everyone to unmute whenever you'd like or use the chat feature to share. Um, maybe whenever you saw pictures or what you think of the pictures um, as we go through them. So photographs are pretty, pretty cool and interesting because they really capture moments in history uh, and solidify that a moment happened. And so these are some really powerful and influential images that we've captured. Um, and it's also interesting how photography can also influence change, right? And I'm sure we've had plenty of examples of that happening throughout life. So with that, I'll start on my first picture. Have we seen this one before? <laughs> And Jessica, um, since we have at least one person who's here just on the phone, but who has the pictures oh, right. at home, maybe just describe which one it is. Yep, Ed, so you, uh, I think, received a, a a packet with this. I think everything's still in the same order, so you should be good. But we are on our first picture. I don't want to give away the title in case anybody knows, but um, the first picture is we have a couple kissing what looks like uh, Times Square. <laughs> Does anyone know what this photo is called? Or who's in the picture? I didn't know what the picture was called either for, for a while. Um, this is VJ Day in Times Square. It's a photograph from 1945. The photographer, we know his name, it's Alfred Eisenstadt. And he was quoted saying, people tell me that when I'm in heaven, they will remember this picture. <laughs> Just, I mean, it was, I think on the cover of the newspaper is the story behind it, or is one of the, you know, how it became so well known. Um, it's a picture of the soldier and a dental nurse and has been one of the most iconic photos of the 20th century, which came at the end of the war. It was a celebration on the streets. Everyone's walking around. And I, oh gosh, I think I, I missed one of my notes here, but I want to say that there was, it was a random picture. Um, he just kind of grabbed his photograph and the soldier just kind of went in for the kiss. They do not know each other. They're a mysterious couple. I don't think their identity has ever been revealed to this day, um, but <laughs> it's a key picture. That's great. Do you want to um, just pause here for a second, Jessica, and um, see if anybody has any comments or what this photo makes you think of any memories or experiences and just just to let you know if you physically raise your hand jessica and i may not see you because yes. we can only see a few little boxes at once so you could go ahead and just unmute yourself and just say out loud what you'd like to say oops It's okay. We've got plenty of pictures. <laughs> I think, you know, for me, this photo, you know, there's so many photos associated with, with war in particular, or just tough times that are so sad. And this one, it just gives you that feeling of happiness, of lightness and just joy. You know, it's wonderful to have a moment like this preserved where people were just feeling such relief that the war was over. Um, and I really like the guy's face in the background. Can I zoom in? Oh, I can. Oh, great. Awesome. I was going to go in there. Yeah. It reminds me of my father who was in the Navy oh. during World War II. Come on. 
Yeah, he had a um, a uniform just like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. He was on a boat in the Pacific when uh, Japan surrendered. They were, oh, they, wow. were about, they were about to sail to Japan. This photo of us? Invade. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah, I guess that is a, I didn't even think of that. That is a naval um, suit. Looks I see like. a, a comment in the chat from Pamela. Um, it gives the feeling, like, as you say, the war was over and everyone was very happy for the soldiers to be home. Very happy feeling. Yeah. Thanks, Pamela. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, actually, um, I can't imagine it. It's, I don't know what that feel. you know, I haven't experienced that um, moment the way that it's just so ingrained in our history that our soldiers are coming home. We haven't really had that in, in my lifetime. Um, so, but I just, I, I mean, I just see their faces and it's just this joyous moment. And Alfred, the photographer, he also did say that his mission with this picture was to find and catch that storytelling moment in this post-World War II photograph um, in Times Square. And yeah, I would say he, he did that with this. Yeah. Does anybody have memories of the end of a military deployment and a feeling like this? Or, of course, there can be a lot of sadness depending on how things went. Anybody have thoughts about experiences like that? Those of you who, who served or who, who have had family who've served? Amy put a comment in the chat. I have a passion for photography and a snapshot like this is more than just a picture. It's a story capturing history. That's a great insight or great comment on that. I like that. Yeah, do you want to say something? Yes. Uh, I was a, a little younger then and uh, I had a brother who was serving in the South Pacific uh, and uh, fortunately he came home okay. Mm. But uh, I remember that period very mm. clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I would just add that my father-in-law served um, as a chaplain's assistant during World War II and um, he never talked about it. Um, and never talked about it as was common. And a couple of, I would say six weeks before he died, I said, could, would you be willing to tell us just, I didn't say about the war, I just said to share some of your story. And he said, yes. And we videotaped him. And six weeks before he died, he told us so many things that we never knew about the war. And we've preserved it. And he shared with us all the V-mail, the victory mail letters that he sent home to his parents every other day. There were hundreds of letters. Mm. Wow. wow. Thank you, Nathan, for sharing about your brother and Margie for sharing about your family member. It's incredible. And how special to have captured that on video. Yeah. Margie. Wow. Steve put in the chat, there's a great statue of this photo in Sarasota, Florida. I did not know that. Oh, I had no idea. Sarasota is not a spot I, I tend to travel to when I'm in Florida, but yeah, apparently it's it's downtown in the city center. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Great. Okay, great. Thank you all for sharing um, on this photo. So our next picture. So all these pictures aren't really ordered in any particular order, other than the size of the picture on the screen. <laughs> So it just gets a little bit bigger each time. Okay. Um, here's our next photograph. Does anybody recognize this image? I see a few head nods and a few faces of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> never seen this. I had never seen this before um, either. So what do you think is going on in this picture? What do you think this picture is trying to tell us? Mm -hmm.
you can guess you don't there's you know you don't have to know if anybody just wants to guess what if you were going to make up a story about this photo what would it be she realized that she stacked up too many books and now she's trying to hold them up all right like <laughs> it does look like the stack could just fall over doesn't it <laughs> does it does look like binders of computer printout yeah it does I hope it's not all the midterm she has to correct over the weekend. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I think that photo is the, all the code that was necessary for one of the, to bring the rocket to the moon. Yeah, you're, yeah, you got it, Olivia. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, so her name is Margaret Hamilton. This photo is from 1969. She was a former school teacher and, um, she took a job as a computer software programmer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, right here in Boston, um, during the late 50s. She was only 24 years old when she did this, <laughs> which is such a big career transition to me, already just at 24. <laughs> Um, initially, she was tasked with working on the meteor meteorological and defense system software, and then she transitioned into aeronautical technology. So now she's getting into the um, NASA work with the spaceships um, at the instrumentation lab at MIT, which is now called the Charles Stark Draper Lab, if anyone's heard of that. Um, so she was working with them in the mid-1960s. And she even created the term software engineer to describe the type of work she was doing, which is now a pretty common term uh, for a job job description. Do we know, so 1969, do we have an idea of maybe what, uh, what mission this was that she was working on? Well, you mentioned the healthy animals when you were there. Yeah. When you picked the first moon landing was, was about that time. I said it. Yeah, I don't know what you said to them. Right? Apollo 11. So in 1965, Hamilton was appointed head of the team that would write and test software for the two computers on NASA's Apollo 11. She had about 100 fellow software engineers working with her. Of course, at that period in time, I think she might have been the only woman or maybe one of very few women. Um, probably the only woman, I think, in the software engineers or women who worked in the building, but not in necessarily in that field. So uh, what they did is they, so this is this is the coding for that mission. And they st she stacked it up. There was a staff photographer who was coming in that day and wanted to capture this picture, volumes of software information. Um, it highlights a few different things. I mean, what do you think? Uh, so now you know a little bit of her backstory. She's a software engineer. She's got all of this coding for the team that she led. Uh, that that created this coding. What does this picture say to you, knowing that backstory? Well, I see a memory that it brought up. Um, Sue put in the chat. Nathan worked at Draper Labs in the 1950s, so Ooh. he probably experienced some of the same kind of environment. Oh, cool! I can tell you that the director of the Brandeis Computer oh, Center at that time I can't look was that. Uh, a woman named Eleanor Stone. It was, in For, it was in Ford Hall. Which I think maybe it doesn't exist anymore. But anyhow, the, so she was the head. And she was ahead of her oh, time as talk. well. Wow. Now you can talk. Uh, I was a resident from General Electric at Draper Laboratory, Laboratories during this period, That's Nathan Doctorow. So I worked with a lot of the engineers uh, who developed the first submarine launch missiles. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful experience. Wow. Oh, I'm, that's awesome. That's so great to hear about, Nathan. Thank you. It makes me think of, has anybody seen the movie Hidden Figures? which is yes. about three black women who were pioneers in um, NASA and they were called computers then. That was what they did was they did the mathematics and they actually called them computers and nothing was set up for them. There wasn't even a bathroom, you know, in the building that women could go to. And so they had to just, 
keep using their skills and slowly earning the respect of the men around them because there was a lot of prejudice toward them, but they, they achieved amazing things. So I see a couple of people saw it. It's a great movie. And it's one of those movies like this photo that reminds us of these people who have been so important in our history. And sometimes we don't even remember them or recognize them. So it's just, this is great. I had yeah. never heard of Margaret Hamilton, Jessica. This is an amazing story. Had you ever seen this photo before? I feel like I've I've run across it. It you know looks vaguely familiar, but I had never known her name or the story behind the photo. Um, but so the uh, Hamilton in 2019, so just a few years ago, she actually commented on the picture and said that. Um, programming at the time especially was never considered to be women's work and at least not in any of the many projects that she had been involved with she oh she mentioned human computers <laughs> just like in hidden figures what you were just sharing um human computers who did calculations by hand were mostly all women and there were women who used calculating machines but they were not programmers then within a couple of years there would be a few and i did have some who worked for me but not many there were always just many more men. Um, and what this photograph really shares and, and signifies, one is it really emphasized the role of women in the process and that they did have a role in this big you know, mission that we're all familiar with, uh, Apollo 11. But it also shows just how much of a pioneering era this was. I mean, getting a moon, I mean, getting a, a, you know, getting humans to the moon um is a pretty big deal and it's the, i mean the the 60s were just full of all of these crazy inventions um that i don't know if we've been able to match in this time period in this era we have social media <laughs> it just uh it's crazy how we we just kind of got phones and TVs and and computers all amazing things. So Margaret Hamilton in her quote, she says, looking back, we were the luckiest people in the world. There were, there was no choice but to be pioneers, no time to be beginners. They just had to do it. And it speaks volumes. Um, just like all those volumes of books that she has that she's oh, just about her height, the code to Apollo 11. Um, and I think I counted about 17 books. Um, which is a relatively small number if you looked at my library, like 17 books would stack maybe that much. <laughs> and then 17 books there are just binderfuls of paper. So uh, let's see, let's move on to our next photograph. Um, Jessica, I just saw a message from Olivia that she needs to leave at 11 and she had a photo she wanted to share too. So, um, what do you yeah. think would make sense? Do you want to do. do you have a digital copy or are you sharing on the screen? Okay. Let me stop sharing. Or I guess I can just also hold up the camera. That's okay. Is that okay? Yeah. You might want to turn off your blur. Your right. Or let me, I can actually just find the picture on my pretty easy. But it's also a, a very popular I, I didn't want to go there. It was like, like people like from my troop were like there when it I'm hearing yeah. some background noise. Is that in your room, it. Olivia? That may or, be, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it says the host disabled uh, screen sharing. Oh, I will let you screen share. There you go. You should be able to do it now. Thank you so much. So this uh, image I brought, to, I wanted to bring was a picture of the Solvay Conference from 1927. Um, growing up, I always had a really big fascination with Mary Curie. And you can see in the photo that Mary Curie is the only female. She's in the front row in the conference of all the male scientists. Uh, the purpose of the Solvay Conference was to talk about um, kind of new pioneering uh, objectives in like the quantum physics realm with like, you know, electrons and stuff. There's like Albert Einstein in here, there's Bohr, Schrodinger, and also there. And um, I just really thought it was a very powerful photo just to see that like, how you were saying earlier at the time, like Mary Curie kind of like, she had no other choice but to be a pioneer. 
she was like the first woman to get a Nobel Prize and even the first male or female to have two Nobel Prizes. So she was always just a very big inspiration for me because also like something I was always cared about is kind of combining like creating a family and also kind of excelling in your uh, career path. And I thought Mary Curie, not only was she so uh, iconic in STEM, but she was also able to have time to, you know, have a family too, which I really, um, I thought was really motivating. And I really aspire to, you know, become some form of, you know, definitely not anything like her, but some form of that. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, right away, I recognized Albert Einstein right up front. I was wondering if that was him. That's amazing, Olivia. Thank you. And I love hearing the inspiration that this photo gives to you. Are you studying science? Do you have a goal to be a scientist? Yeah, right now I made, I'm doing a triple major for uh, chemistry, neuroscience, and biology. And hopefully I'm on the track for, uh, you know, pre-med. Hopefully I'm a doctor one day, but I still go. But right now I'm just doing STEM, general studying. That's wonderful. Well, we we would love to have you in the field of medicine. I'm sure that you bring a lot of gifts to it. That's terrific. And Dave puts in the chat, I love hearing about these famous women as a dad of a daughter and the husband of a software engineer. I love that. Oh, that, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. All right, let me get my screen back up. But um, that was that was a great photo to follow up on. So thank you for us uh, messaging about it. Um, okay. All right. So here is oh weird. Okay, here is my next photograph. So I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit because it's a it's a bit of a blurry image. Has anyone seen? Oh, maybe I can't see it too much. I'm not fine. Has anyone seen this picture before or want to guess what is going on in this picture? Because it might be a little bit hard to decipher at a first glance. What do we think? Looks like guesses are run across a frozen lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carl, you said it was somebody. Say that again running across some frozen water maybe a pond or something okay yeah looks like he's running over some water i see something that looks almost like um the beginning of the building of a railroad track possibly yeah it looks like a piece of railroad i thought it was a ladder but i think actually you might be right it does look more like a railroad track and in the background, it does say Railowski. So I think you're onto something, Talia. Um, and I can see the water because you see the reflection. Sorry, who was that? Mm -hmm. All right. So this, um, let me share the title Jumping the Puddle. Okay, so we've got a puddle of water, and the photographer's name is Henry Cartier Bresson. And this was a scene that he captured through a fence behind the Saint Lazare train station in Paris, in Paris. It's one of his most iconic photos, and what he refers to uh, with this picture is the decisive moment. Uh, he thinks this is a perfect example of of that. There is nothing in this world that does not have a decisive moment. So Henry Cartier-Bresson, he's often referred to as the father of modern photojournalism. He did coin the term the decisive moment because he was referring to the moment when a photographer captures a fleeting second and immortalizes it in time. And I think that really captures what's happening here. This man is probably, maybe he's running to the train station, maybe he's running off the train and trying to get to work on time. And so that moment of, I need to jump over this puddle, right? The photographer just caught it <laughs> in a picture um, back in 1930. And we have this image to look at today. We have no information about who this man is uh, that's running, but it looks like there's a hat. He's wearing a hat. 
Just a couple mm -hmm. comments in the chat. So Pamela commented, it looks like maybe he's being chased by an animal on a frozen pond. And I think it is such a storytelling photo. You know, you could, it makes you wonder what happened just before, you know, what, what made him leap, leap over the pond. And then Rick said that Jerry and he know this photo well, the oh. photographer Cartier-Bresson inspired Rick and Jerry to become photographers themselves. And they own a couple of his books, including one called The Decisive Moment. I love that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. And Jerry and Rick, I don't, let me see. Did they, did you all share any photos um, with Beth? We'd, I'd love to see some of the pictures you guys come up with. Yeah, Maybe and it could be another later. time too, you know, cause yeah. I know today might might not be a good day for that, but um, we always, and this is your first time at the cafe and welcome, we're so glad to have you. And we always spend the last half hour as kind of our chatting and sharing time. So even if, um, you or others have a photo you didn't bring today, but you'd like to at some point, you could do that another month as well. And um, Talia, I love art too. Talia says, go to the art museum. And it's so good to be reminded that taking some time to look at art, whether you go to the art museum, whether you look at some books of art or any other way that you can see it, it is so good for the soul. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad that we have someone who's connected to this picture. That's pretty cool. Great. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next image. This is a this is a pretty notable figure, right? In history. Anyone want to share? Shout out his name. Is he Alfred Hitchcock? No, that's good such guess. a good guess. Good guess. Good guess. <laughs> Winston Churchill. Yes, Nathan, you got it. You got it. Yeah. And do does anyone know the story behind this picture? He does look like Alfred Hitchcock too, though. He does. <laughs> yeah. So this photograph was taken in the uh, wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor when Churchill, he arrived into Ottawa to thank the allies for their assistance. Um, let me see. This photo ended up becoming the cover of Life magazine in 1945. It was printed on millions of posters, post stamps, and even recently on five pound banknotes. Today, it is considered to be the most recognized picture of the former prime minister and one of the most famous photos in history. The author of this photo was 33-year-old Yusuf Karsh. He only received $100 for taking this picture. And on top of that, he did receive the reputation of the portrait photography genius because to achieve this picture, he had to behave a little bit unconventionally. And I am, um, I'm not a history buff, honestly. So I'm, I couldn't, you know what? I learned more about Winston Churchill when I was watching The Crown <laughs> on, <laughs> on the story of, um, of, you know, the royal family. And I, I actually, that's where I kind of realized what exactly Winston Churchill's uh, role was as prime minister and his connection to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, so, you got to see a little bit of his character play out, you know, who we know of Winston Churchill. And he seems like a pretty tough guy, right? He, he's, he seems like a, he's, you can tell in this picture, right? The face he's giving. And so he had been, I believe they actually captured this moment in the crown. I want to say that when, when they had the photographer come to take a picture of him. And so he had no idea that they had somebody who had commissioned to take his portrait. And so he was a big cigar smoker. And the, the guy, Yusuf Karsh, he's there with his camera and Churchill had the cigar and re refused to get rid of it. And so what did Karsh do? He sets up everything for the picture. He has him standing in a spot and without any warning, just walks right up to Winston Churchill, moves, removes the cigar from his mouth 
and in that moment just captures this picture and that's why you see his face kind of scowling at him um and of the incident churchill says to karsh you can even make a roaring lion stand still to be photographed and i think that's uh pretty <laughs> that's some really good feedback i'd say that's a compliment uh to the photographer it is one of the most, yeah, it is one of the most reprodu reproduced political portraits that we have. And it gave photographers permission to take more honest and even critical portraits of political leaders, which we have seen a rise in. So Yusuf Karsh, he writes, or he, he says about this incident, by the time I got back to my camera, he looked so belligerent, he could have devoured me. It was at that instant I took the photograph. <laughs> That's great. Sharon and Len put in the chat, the Armenian Library in Watertown Square has an exhibit of several iconic Karsh photographs. Great. So if you like this and you want to go look in person. Yeah, and the, and I, I love that they put that in the chat. I googled him and it says that's most likely because he was an Armenian genocide survivor. Mm -hmm. Wow. So he came to his work having a lot of lived through a lot of really tough experiences himself. Wow. And um, Jerry and Rick say, Karsh is an amazing portrait photographer. The Museum of Fine Arts owns a number of his photographs and hosted an exhibit on him a few years back. And Jerry and Rick have a Karsh photograph of Robert Frost. Ooh, nice, nice, amazing. I'm so glad that these uh, photographers are resonating. I, I'm not well, sure they really do, them. don't these photos make yeah. such an impact on our lives? Take care, Carl, thanks for coming. Have a good rest of the day. Yeah. Stay warm. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'm just appreciating these photos even more. Every time I, I've looked through these photographs, because I've used this presentation with another group, and I mean, I just always learn something else about them. And I, I mean, they are so iconic for a reason. So I appreciate everyone's input on these and sharing more information on them as we go through them. All right, any other comments on Winston Churchill? On our famous prime minister, not ours, the UK's. <laughs> All right, next photograph. Hmm. So we know who these, these folks are. And you may not know who they were, you may, but what do you think of what they're doing? Does this bring to mind any style of music or style of dance or any any experiences you've had or something you've seen? If you could hear the music, what do you think it would be? I, I, I suggest jazz, swing, swing music. Swing, swing yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I see big band jazz swing in the chat. Could okay. be rock and roll too, somebody said. Yes. R&B. Nathan? Yeah, do you have something to say? I, I, um, this is Nathan Doctorow. I was at Draper Lab as a resident from General Electric, and I witnessed a lot of the uh, activities there. Amazing. Thank you, Nathan. And Suzanne says, at the hop, bop, bop, bop. Hop, bop, bop. Yeah. Yep. So this is uh, this is Leon James and Willa May Ricker. I love her name, Willa May. I <laughs> think that's such a beautiful name. Um, this is a photograph from 1943, and if you see the uh, on the bottom right of the photo, 
that is the emblem for Life magazine. So this was published in the Life, the infamous Life magazine. Um, Leon James, he was one of the Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. Is that how you pronounce it? Whitey's, Whitey's. Um, he had a pretty, pretty strong on stage personality in Lindy Hopping with his constantly moving hands and legs and his flashing eyes, everyone would always notice him first. I mean, he is kind of, you look at this picture and my eyes just kind of dart right to him. I love the position he's in. <laughs> um, you can just tell that they're having a lot of fun here. Um, let's see. I wish Paul was on here. I think he already left, right? Cause he's a dancer. I wonder. I think so. If he's familiar, yeah. Anybody here ever do the Lindy Hop? I never heard of the Lindy Hop. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of the Lindy Hop either. Um, but I, I I think it's a jazz, right? Is that or swing, a style I think. of dance? I've known people who do swing dance and that was part of it. Anybody here who's who's done the lindy hop can you give us a demo anybody <laughs> <laughs> looks like you have to be pretty flexible yeah and um, someone someone also said bobby soxers which i think of as more jitterbug oh okay and then jitterbug i think of elvis yeah. <laughs> jitterbug so Leon James, um, he had, so this was, he was able to pursue his dancing career a lot more uh, because he actually had pretty poor eyesight. So he was not drafted during World War II and that allowed him to pursue this art a lot more and, and make a name for himself as a Lindy Hop and jazz dancer. Was a performer during the 30s and 40s with the Harlem-based Lindy Hoppers uh, with Willa Mae Ricker. And they were featured in this photo essay in August of 1943 in this issue of Life magazine. Um, there was a oh man. Okay. All right. Next photograph. Here we go. Is anyone familiar with this picture? Again, it's one of those that right away, you kind of have to, I'm gonna give you everyone a minute just to kind of look at it and try to figure out what it is that we're looking at. Looks like, oh, oh, I don't know if you're taking, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Linda. Um, I agree with uh, Miss Reed, Titanic. Oh, yeah. Yep. It does kind of look the, like the Titanic. It reminds me of the Titanic. Yep. I'm kind of getting um, Ellis Island um, vibes from this picture. Like the ferry to go to see the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. Is that, yeah. I was seeing the chat Ellis Island immigration from Suzanne. Immigration. Why immigration? Why did that? What are you thinking with that? A few people are saying immigration and that the Titanic, it might, people might look more touristy, Susan puts in, whereas it looks more like immigrants to her. It's really good insight. And Especially you know, because they're with the children, Susan says, and Suzanne says a variety of clothing styles. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that there's a difference in the style in everyone's appearance between the top deck and the lower deck. Did anybody notice that? So this image is titled The Steerage. It's an image from 1907. It actually is not, I, I want, it is an image, they are immigrants on the, it is a ship. You guys are really spot on with that. Not the Titanic, but it is a ship. 
and it, there are immigrants on this ship, they were actually leaving the United States and heading towards England, I want to say. They were uh, moving away. Um, the photographer is named Alfred Steidlitz. One of his most famous, or he is one of the most famous photographers of the 20th century. And so he really fought for photography to be taken more seriously as paintings, right, are very, you know, taken seriously as, as an art form. And his work helped to change the way that many did view photography. He has a gallery in New York City that features many of the best photographers of the day. And this image, the searage, not only encapsulates what he called straight photography, which offers a truthful take on the world, it also gives us a more complex and multi-layered viewpoint that conveys abstract through the different shapes in the image and how those shapes relate to one another. So every time I look at this picture, I also see something different. Um, when, he, when I saw his comments about these shapes that are in the image, that's when I noticed the divide of people on the top deck and people on the lower deck. At the beginning, I just thought people on the lower deck I thought that was where the showers were. <laughs> um, but then I noticed that it looks like it's a lot of women and children. And I see almost like a people hanging their clothes or hanging their towels up. And then everyone on the top deck is dressed up with suits and just looking over the boat. They're They're both pretty crowded. Alfred, he says about the picture, I stood spellbound for a while. I saw shapes related to one another, a picture of shapes and underlying it, a new vision that held me. So Ava put in the chat, um, thank you, Ava. The pronunciation of his name is Stieg Stieglitz. Stieglitz. And Sharon and Led said, um, he, Stieglitz is also famous for being the husband of Georgia O'Keeffe. I don't know if they, were they actually married? um i recognize the I name see. georgia o'keefe but what who is she very famous american painter um painted really close-up images of flowers and a lot of paintings from the southwest with hills and skull abstractions of um, cow skulls and things like that so I I um I looked it up on Wikipedia and they were married from 1924 until uh, he died in 1946. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I saw an exhibit of theirs and I saw her home where she painted from out in um, New Mexico. Her mountains were her muse. Wow. Yeah, this is a pretty intense photograph because you would think it was something else as opposed to a... Whoops, Margie, you're on mute. I mean, this photo is intense because you would think it was immigrants coming to America, but it's immigrants going on a cruise. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were people who would go back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, who had maybe weren't absolutely destitute and they would work and save and they go back home. Yeah, it's really interesting. Sure. Thank you. I also think it's interesting because it's so close up. And when I think yeah. of pictures of ship scenes at that time, a lot of times they are farther back. So you see more of the ship. But this one, it's really focused on the human drama, you know, like the ship is just the stage almost. And it's about yeah. what's going on with the people. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for the pronunciation. Alfred Stiedlitz, Stiedlitz. Did I get that right? Yeah, thanks. Good. All right, here's our next photograph. This is kind of a mystery photo. We actually don't have a lot of history on this. So I'm curious what you all would, would story this picture as, you know, what's the story behind it? Who do you think this man is? He looks like an officer because he's wearing some type of uniform. Mm -hmm. He's got the little star on his vest, right? So he, yeah. he does look like he's um, 
like law enforcement of some sort. Pamela says the first African American sheriff. Ooh, yeah, could be. Uh, also, too, maybe like a cowboy of some sort because he has like the um the rope for like lassoing. But maybe that might be be for tying up criminals too, <laughs> like back in the old west. Yeah, I think you're on to something, Terry. Yeah. Tying up criminals. <laughs> uh, you know how they show the Western movies where they <laughs> yeah. tie them up. What would you guys title this? What title would you give this image? Could be a sheriff, could be a cowboy, could be both. Or maybe the sheriff that's training horses because there's another horse in the back. That's true. Amy says diversity in the old west and there was a lot of diversity and we don't always remember that there were a, a number of black sheriffs and certainly a lot of African Americans who were cowboys, cowboys you know, yeah. and cowgirls too, probably. Sheriff on duty is another suggestion for title. And another one is there's a new sheriff in town. Ooh, I, I love that, that one. <laughs> yeah. He does look like he means business, you know. Or maybe because what actually what history doesn't tell you too, that what the, the the Lone Ranger was actually black. Oh, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Wow, wow. Is the Lone Ranger, that's the TV series, right? So yeah, but he's, was he's that white supposed to be a real, per, a real person? Yeah. Who inspired like back that? In it, like is that, it was, a, is it, that um, right? Made up to even like the first Betty Boop, the real Betty Boop was black. Huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. It tells know, you, you gotta, you gotta look more deeply into history. Yeah. And um, let's see, Pamela said Marshall Bodine. Oh, I like that. Great. So this this picture was tied to an article about cowboys, about black cowboys. And okay. how yeah. Well, it doesn't tell me if he's a sheriff, but he has that, he looks like he might be. So he's gotta be something of the two, but they don't have a name for this man. Um, they actually the article was more about Nat Love. Has anyone heard of Nat Love? He was a famous, um, he was a famous black cowboy who was known as Deadwood Dick. I think they made a lot of stories about him. He was kind of a fun, he was, he was a real man, but I think um, there was a book that recounted some of his stories. Because when we think of cowboys and westerns and just like the TV genre, any names come to mind? Because I have one name that comes, one name and one image that comes to mind. I'm thinking of John Wayne. Familiar with John Wayne? <laughs> the Wild West. Um, turns out we we don't have a lot of depictions of, of Black cowboys. Uh, when in reality, one in four cowboys were Black. So it's kind of a rare image to find. And I'm glad that we have this photo. I, I love to just kind of see, you can kind of see his demeanor. He's just sitting there. He looks pretty relaxed and is just getting his picture taken. Um, I don't know. I, my, when, I, when I saw this, I kind of was wondering, you know, what would I want to ask him? What would you want to ask this man? I would ask him out on a date because he looks yeah. Fine. <laughs> good looking man. He's got a good career. <laughs> exactly. Anyone else? <laughs> Okay. I have one. Sure, Malcolm, what is it? 
there's a history of black cowboys and black rodeos in Colorado. Okay. That goes way, way back because I lived in Colorado for decades and uh, read and listened to historians uh, on the history of, of black rodeos and black cowboys in, in the Southwest and also in, and also in Texas. It's been it's been around for a long, long time. Don't going back uh, into the twenties. Yes. So, no, I'm glad you brought that up. So, what I had read a little bit about was the cowboy lifestyle when it kind of came in. It was I, from what I read, it was in Texas, right? Because Texas had kind of been a cattle country when it was colonized by Spain in the 1500s. So, cattle farming became more uh, popular and uh, it was an economic thing and cultural phenomenon that was recognized, you know, still into the, into the late 1800s. And then in the early 1800s, we had men going into the Spanish and Mexican territories of Texas to start their farms. And at that period, right, they actually brought slaves with them. And so then those- That's what I was going to say. Yeah, those men were then trained. Sorry, Terry, what was that? Yes, yeah, I was going to say, that's what I was going to say. A lot of the, the slave, because I just pulled it up, like I said, on um, that the real Lone Ranger was um, a Black man, and his name was Bass Reeves. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Great. he was a former slave, and um, and he was with the Old West during, um, when he was... Um, younger or whatever and it was also saying did he have a um an indian companion it's like all these things they made up with the show but they're trying to figure out how it coincides with the actual history but i heard that years ago that the real lone ranger was a black man and i just pulled it up and his name was bass reeves bass reeves great yes b-a-s-s-r-e-e-v-e-s -E 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 okay and they have hey. a picture of him from like six um they have a picture of him yeah. Ooh, Terry, yep. I just want to, Terry, I just want to thank you so much for sharing yeah. that because <laughs> uh, names are really important and knowing the real story and, you know, so many of us grew up on the Lone Ranger and yeah, uh, yeah to know, yeah, that's, it's very disturbing that um, Bass Reeves was forgotten and I really appreciate that you shared that with us and he is on Wikipedia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says, it says where the legend meets history. It says remembering the real Lone Ranger. A lot of things, uh, you know, that they kind of fabricate or make into what, you know, they want you to believe was like the real story because they don't want you to think that we as a people had so much contribution to a lot of things, you know, mm -hmm. just exactly. like because I exactly. bring it up a lot in um in different uh, meetings where uh, people think that um. Uh, Barack Obama was our first black president and he wasn't. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His name was, um, um, oh God, John Hanson. Oh. John Hanson. And this is before George Washington because it wasn't until George Washington when they started calling the leaders of the colonies and the states and whatever presidents. Before that, they would just call leaders or whatever. And a black man named John Hansen was one of them. And there was like several after him before George Washington. I'm wow. going to look that up. Thank you, Terry. Yes, his name is John Hansen. He also created the presidential seal and also with the um, did the third Thursday um, as Thanksgiving. Oh, so, my yes. Wow. Wow, and he's also cool. on the back of the $2 bill when you see them signing and whatever, like you'll see a darker figure or whatever. That's him. John Hanson. John Hanson. Yep. Thank you John for Hansen. highlighting him. Yeah. Yep. The first black president. History classes these days. Are yeah, but they just weren't so called much. presidents back then. Right. Before right. George Washington. That makes sense. Um, yeah. That they changed titles. So. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's sad how much is lost in history. Oh yes, we don't really get to hear about. Yeah, I just um, had some things come to me historically, things I had read about the black cowboys. Actually, 
And cowboy was a very racially specific and demeaning mm -hmm. uh, term. Exactly. And, and uh, it originally came from, uh, it came from Northern Africa. And then uh, it was uh, originally, uh, they implemented this on the Iberian Peninsula. Okay. I remember the book I read about, uh, about black cowboys and black rodeos. And you can't forget, most, a lot of this stuff really started in California also, because there was, there was a, 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 an integration of, um, of people from Mexico and from Northern Africa that were involved in the rodeos. So from the Iberian Peninsula, Spanish, on and on, into California and Texas, but it was very prominent. In fact, the, uh, I just recall the most prominent black cowboy was Bill Pickett. Mm. And uh, he actually, uh, I believe that would have been from the 1800s. And I think, I think he, um, he was deceased in the early 1930s. Great, wow. Yeah, because they were the down. ones that were taking care of the cattle and doing different things or whatever. And then, you know, they had to, um, you know, uh, what, would, what can I say? Um, uh, like when you um, not necessarily practice your craft, that's not what I'm, um, um, that's not the word I'm looking for. But, you know, for, you know, because they had to be good at what they were doing to like kids get the, the uh, herding the cows and the cattle and all that stuff. And then a lot of that stuff too, they were doing as like entertainment for entertainment purposes. So yeah. like he said, like, you know, they're not going to call him a man. So they were like, yeah, those are the cowboys, you know? Right. Right. So. Yeah. I was reading yeah. about that as well. It was cow hand yeah. was what they referred to. Yes. Um, white cow hands and and cowboys right that was the mm -hmm. difference and then cowboys just ended up sticking and that's what we know the term today to be um but yeah so we're coming up on time but just to finish a little bit on this picture um <laughs> and i mean i mean thank you so terry and malcolm gave us great history on this and i'm so glad you guys brought it up because i i know a little bit i learned a little bit with this picture but i wasn't very familiar with all the details you you brought in so that was wonderful um, uh, what was I saying? So they, uh, during that period when all of these landowners came into Texas, into these areas and started kind of this, uh, field of work, I guess you could call it. They had slaves who were, who were doing most of the hands-on work. And what happened is the civil war was going on at the end of the, I'm not sure on my eras, 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, I want to say, or early 1900s. And so those landowners, they went to go fight in the war alongside everyone else. Um, and it wasn't really in the Texas area. So what happens is they leave um, their, their cow hands or cowboys behind to keep, you know, the, the farms going and keep everything going. What happened is that... Um, at the time, barbed wire hadn't been invented. <laughs> so a lot of the cattle and horses just kind of went loose and it was a lot more and too much to handle. So when the uh, landowners came back into town, they found their farms just sort of in this chaos. But we also had the Emancipation Proclamation at that time. So then they didn't have that free labor anymore to be able to put their farms back together. And that kind of started, that was interesting because then it became an opportunity to, for, for an, it was an opportunity for paid work now for black men on top of being elevator men and, and doing these other jobs that were pretty common because they had the skill, because they had been working on the farm and had sort of been trained in this field. Um, now they had an opportunity to be paid for that after the Emancipation Proclamation. So they were. And that was a way for them to get help back on their farms. And um, Nat Love, he there's a lot of stories about him. He shared a lot on the camaraderie uh, between cowboys, with, and he shared a lot of admiration for that. He said, a braver, truer set of men never lived than these wild sons of the plains whose home was in the saddle and their couch, Mother Earth, with the sky for a covering. 
They were always ready to share their blanket and their last ration with a less fortunate fellow companion always and always assisted each other in the many trying situations that were continuing continuously coming up in a cowboy's life. The West, uh, and then this is a historian who talked about it. He said, the West was a vast open space and a dangerous place to be. Cowboys had to depend on one another. They couldn't stop in the middle of some crisis, like a stampede or an attack by wrestlers and sort out who was black and who was white. So black people in the in this world operated on a level of equality with the white cowboys during this period when that wasn't necessarily the case everywhere else. So it's a, it is a really interesting part of history. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I would name this American cowboy. That was my title for this picture. Um, so anyway, it is, it is 1123. So I think we'll pass it off. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, if you want to, if you want to do, um, we have time for at least one more. Do you want to do one more or do you want to? We can do one more. Or, or we could see the photos people brought. And then if there's time at the end, we could go back and look at more. Yeah, we could do that. Do I, I like that idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Did anyone have any final comments on some of the pictures we went over? Well, a huge thank you to Jessica for doing all that research and for just bringing in wonderful pictures. And um, 